Hi, everyone. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon um, for the last migration seminar of uh, 2022. So my name is Laura Kleto. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the United Nations University Merit uh, in Maastricht, and I'm convening this seminar series on behalf of UNU Merit and Maastricht University. Um, so the migration seminar series invites researchers, but also practitioners and policymakers uh, to discuss their work uh, that relates to migration in one capacity or the other. And before I will introduce today's speaker to you, um, there's some housekeeping, as I said, that I'll need to do. So um, Leah's talk today will last for approximately 30 to 40 minutes, um, after which we'll have time for a discussion and questions um, from your side. So I'd like to ask you to keep your questions until after uh, our speaker is done with the presentation. So you can then either put the question in the chat um, so, and I will then read it out loud for you, or you can raise your hand by using the raise your hand uh, function uh, from Zoom. Um, and then I'll allocate turns so you can post the question yourself. Please be aware um, that in the meantime, it would be great if you could keep your microphone shut. Your cameras can be turned on if you like, um, but as I said, please be aware that we are recording this seminar um, for distribution via our YouTube channel later on. Um, on our YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of previous migration seminar series um, that we did in the past years. So then now let me please introduce our speaker um, to you. Um, so we are really, really happy um, to welcome Dr. Lea Mudefink, um, who works as a senior researcher at the Department of Migration and Globalization at Danube University Krems uh, in Austria. Uh, Lea, Lea's work focuses uh, broadly on diaspora politics, uh, migration processes and displacement contexts, um, as well as migration governance, with a focus um, ge geographical on the Middle East, North Africa, but also Europe. Um, she holds a joint PhD in comparative politics and Arabic studies from Science Po uh, and Vienna University, also in Austria. And over the past years, um, Lea has been involved in a variety of research projects that center on um, uh, the topic that she will also talk on today. Um, her current project, uh, Seriality, um, focuses on drivers of immobility and migration decision-making processes of Syrian refugees in the Middle East and in Europe. And it seeks to investigate how broader life aspirations influence uh, their decision making regarding their migration, uh, including how war and displacement influence broader life aspirations and how forced migrants legal status and the context of their reception in different European countries and um, impact their life aspirations and their well being. So it's quite a lot. Um, I know from experience that this is really super interesting work. Um, so I'm really, really happy that Leah is here to um, to share this um, with us. Um, but I'm sure that she'll also introduce her work in a little bit more depth in a minute from now. Um, so without much further ado, I would really like to hand the floor over to Leah. Thank you so much once again for being here and the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this research seminar and uh, the opportunity to, to talk about my research and my work. Um, I followed your um, offer to really present a work in progress, um, which I like to do. And also, I think it's a very nice uh, opportunity to get uh, feedback from everyone here. Um, so I will share my screen. Um... Can you all see my, my PowerPoint? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to uh, do today is to, um, to build, um, so my talk basically today um, builds on two work in uh, progress papers. Um, on the one hand, a co-authored conceptual piece uh, together, which I have uh, worked on together with Aishin Ustovici from Koch University. Um, and uh, Milena Belloni from the Universities of Antwerp and Ghent, uh, which is uh, entitled Daring to Aspire. Um, and we are currently working on the revisions. Um, so I'm very happy also to, to get feedback um, on that. Um, and um, this paper aims to further conceptualize aspirations in contexts of displacement and highly um, constrained mobility. Um, and the second uh, uh, paper is an empirical paper about uh, violence, life aspirations and displacement trajectories, uh, trajectories in uh, civil war um, and aims to uh, build a better understanding of mobilities, but also immobilities in civil war settings um, by asking what about conflict drives some people to move while others uh, stay behind. Um, as uh, Laura uh, said, this research really builds on, on, on several projects I have been doing um, since 2017. Um, and also I want to highlight again that feedback is really very welcome. Um, 
So the just to I, I wanted to talk about this uh, conceptual paper as well in the beginning to uh, to to introduce a bit uh, conceptually um, where where I'm coming from and um, um, where the empirical paper I'm going to present later builds on. Um, so this conceptual um, paper is a conceptual effort to address the paradox between vulnerability and agency in current uh, refugee policies, but also in the theoretical understandings of migration theory. Um, as uh, we know from migration theory, all forms of migration require agency and face constraints uh, to different degrees. Um, yet, um, as we argue in this paper, the understanding of the role of human agency in contexts of displacement is still limited and often um, biased by a politicized context. Um, because um, binary distinctions between refugees and economic migrants keep prevailing in humanitarian discourse, um, with re uh, recent international uh, agreements, such as the Global Compact, being heavily focused on refugees' vulnerabilities and their reduced choices of options rather than their agency. Um, and in asylum policy and refugee politics, aspirations and agency um, are often neglected and overlooked, um, perceiving displaced people um, often as passive uh, victims. Um, so we say that it's actually crucial to reconsider this impasse between, on the one hand, safeguarding the need to protect asylum seekers, but also the need uh, to account for their agency, uh, which is an impasse that has been also highlighted not only by, by us, but also by other um, scholars. And um, what we are trying to do um, in this paper is to uh, contribute to the elaboration of the aspiration capability framework by bridging literature on agency and structure, migration theory, uh, political mobilization and empirical psychological research about refugees coping mechanisms. Um, and we argue that balancing between these two positions um, which means safeguarding the basis for protecting asylum seekers and the importance of accounting for the agency uh, may, may require scholars to um, consider on the one hand the importance of stay aspirations, um, recognize the fact that stay aspirations can be co-present um, to migration aspirations, which influences how mobility is experienced by refugees and displaced people themselves. Um, and analyze the key role of aspirations to cope with trauma at an individual level and to make claims at a collective level. Um, we define agency in this paper following Emir Bayer and Misha as a temporarily embedded process of social engagement informed by the past, but also oriented towards uh, the future and towards the present. Um, and we argue that such a conceptual perspective helps us uh, to better grasp uh, the link between aspirations and capabilities uh, over time. We, we see agency as the capacity to imagine and also dare to realize alternative futures and by doing so uh, resist hostile and violent environments. Um, and the term daring here is understood as a, as a resisting act in such a context. Um, we define life aspirations as people's perceptions of the good life and uh, emphasize that these perceptions uh, can relate to a wide variety of changing perceptions of what a good life uh, might be. Um, they can be situated on different levels. Um, on the individual level, they might be related to one's education, profession and prestige, um, such as social mobility. Um, but also the people we love and cherish. And on the collective level, um, they can be about ideas about one's culture and religion, uh, ideas of justice, political legitimacy, and ultimately about the kind of society people would like to uh, live in. Um, we suggest extending the dominant way of looking at migration as preferable to non-migration by including stay aspirations to an equal um, degree. Um, so we understand migration, which include return aspirations and stay aspirations as a mean to realize life aspirations by migrating or staying. Um, and we define stay aspirations not only as the desire to remain home, whatever that means, but also as the desire to re-emplace oneself in a new environment. 
Um, so how are aspirations related to capabilities? Um, responses to these questions um, are in fact quite contradictory in the existing literature. Um, if we look into the uh, capacity to aspire in, in Apadurai's terms in relation to general life aspirations, um, Apadurai has argued that the capacity to aspire is in fact not evenly distributed in society, arguing that uh, the wealthier tend to have more exposure and means to explore alternative futures. Um, along the same lines, uh, Carling and Collins and De Haas have argued that life aspirations are highly influenced by the individual perceptions of local and remote social economic opportunities. Um, uh, researchers by, by Czajka and Wurtknecht, but also Carling has shown that aspirations and capabilities in fact influence each other. Um, on the other hand, there's also existing research that shows that people do continue to aspire even in conditions that are highly adverse or hostile to the realization of their aspirations. Um, Lauren, for example, has talked about cruel optimism, optimism in, such, uh, in such a context. Um, on the other hand, there is also literature um, that uh, focuses specifically on migration capabilities. Um, and here, migration is conceptualized as the outcome of a person's aspirations and capabilities to migrate within a certain uh, society following the Haas. So uh, migration capabilities are the second step in the migratory process to realize um, um, migration. Um, uh, Carolyn Schul, for example, defined migration capabilities as the resources, opportunities and constraints that de determine whether and how migration aspirations may be realized. Um, in our definition, we, we redefine capabilities as the personal resources needed to realize both staying and migration, including return in a specific structural context. And we um, argue that migration capabilities, stay capabilities and return capabilities are needed to overcome not only the immigration interface, but also to overcome um, what we call the stay interface and return interface, um, drawing on um, also um, some publications that are coming out now that look really into um, how origin countries in civil war try to restrict um, return, but also um, force exit in civil um, uh, war contexts. Um, and we argue in, in, in our paper that capabilities include different personal resources, uh, such as personal features, such as age, education, gender, nationality, um, economic and social resources, uh, which refer to financial, social and cultural capital, but also emotional resources, which relate to risk aversion, but also positive cognition to resist trauma and depression. Um, and while we conceptualize capabilities as personal resources, uh, we also stress that personal resources can be lifted to a collective level through political mobilization. Um, so um, what we what we also highlight in this paper that um, what I um, introduced uh, before um, that people continue to have aspirations and concomitant imaginations in contexts where their realization seems or is unreachable or inexistent. Um, especially psychological research, but also social research shows that focusing on prospective life aspirations and imaginations, how to realize them can serve in fact as a mental coping strategy to deal with the radical social change and the traumatic experiences civilians and refugees often go through during conflict and displacement. So we, we say that it is important to recognize how displaced people continue to have agency even in conditions of extreme deprivation and lack of freedom. Because daring to have aspirations in such adverse contexts can by, be by itself an active act of defiance and resistance. Um, and now I want to move on uh, to, to, to the empirical part um, of this talk. Um, so first of all, 
why do I think is it important to write a paper on mobilities and immobilities in civil war um, settings? Um, so the paper, as I said before, aims to build a better understanding um, of immobilities and mobilities in civil war by asking what about conflict drives some people to move while others stay behind. Um, it is widely acknowledged in the literature that violence is one of the main determinants of forced migration. Um, there is a rich uh, literature on the logics behind combatants forcing people to flee, for instance, uh, to gain control of a territory or to learn more about uh, displaced populations. Um, however, it remains rather unclear how the subjective experience of violence influences migration decision making in displacement contexts how these experiences interact with other factors, including life aspirations, and also how displacement journeys are undertaken across internal and external borders. Um, and these gaps are, um, as I argue, related on the one hand to an overall focus on structural factors in much of the existing literature, um, considering that people have no choice but to leave. Um, it is also related to insufficient data on immobility um, and, and internal displace, uh, displacement mostly. Um, and there is often weak, especially quantitative data about immobility and mobility in conflict settings. Despite the fact uh, that most uh, displacement uh, happens in conflict countries and towards neighboring countries in the global south, uh, with developing countries hosting 85% of the world's uh, refugees. Um, also, when we look at UNHCR statistics, uh, a large number of displaced people in the Global South are actually not registered, registered with UNHCR for different reasons. Um, and when we look uh, at data on internal displacement, uh, these rely often on the cooperation with national authorities and are often very politicized and uh, often large parts of conflict countries remain inaccessible for data collection due to security reasons. And uh, finally, data on, uh, on immobility is rarely uh, collected. Um, so what I'm doing in this paper is trying to go beyond a macro um, level perspective by drawing on the aspiration capability framework to understand what happens at the micro level. So, um, by not only looking into who one is, but also who one aspires to be and how one wants to live. Um, as, uh, as I mentioned before, I define life aspirations as people's perceptions of the good life. Um, and life aspirations as such are highly subject to change and may change over people's migration and displacement trajectories, but are also related to life stages. Um, and it's important also to point out that civil war settings are um, contexts where social and political orders are often contested um, and uh, are prone to change broader life aspirations. Um, and I argue in this paper that it is intersections of different subjective experiences of violence and gendered, stratified and changing life aspirations related to love, work and social and political change. Uh, which can explain the complex displacement trajectories across internal and external borders over time. Um, I want to share also some notes about uh, the research design of this paper. Um, so this is a um, purely qualitative uh, 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 paper. Um, the data draws from two internationalized civil wars, the Syrian and the Libyan conflict since 2011, um, after the uprisings. Um, they are both situations of protected displacement, uh, which have uh, witnessed massive internal and external displacement. So, for example, if you look at the Syrian uh, situation, um, these are um, this is data from 2022. Um, so, the estimates um, uh, say that uh, 5.6 million Syrians uh, um, have been displaced externally. Um, while 6.7 million um, people um, have been displaced internally, which uh, is basically half of the pre-war population. And in Libya, um, in 2000, uh, there have been uh, around 1.4 million IDPs since 2011, 
and um, there are, are very um, different figures for externally displaced Libyans due to the fact that they are not registered in neighboring countries as refugees, um, ranging from 800,000 to 2 million, um, and uh, they have been mostly uh, displaced to uh, Tunisia and Egypt. So even if this, you, you, we have to take these figures with a lot of uh, precaution, um, these estimations still indicate that around a third of the pre-war population has, uh, has uh, faced uh, displacement. Um, so this paper builds on the analysis of 91 qualitative interviews with Syrians and Libyans living in different urban spaces of Syria, uh, Lebanon, Libya and Tunisia conducted between 2018 and 2021. Um, so what uh, this has been a collective data uh, collection uh, attempt, um, as you can uh, guess from 91 interviews. Um, but what we try to do is to cover different regions of control inside conflict countries and uh, a city, a capital city, the capital city um, plus a city closer to the border. Um, both contexts, Libya and uh, Syria, are also very different con um, contexts with regards to mobility control. Um, so um, with regards to Syria, um, the borders uh, to neighboring countries, Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey have been increasingly closed since 2014, uh, while the borders between Libya and Egypt and Tunisia have mostly remained open for Libyans, uh, not for non-Libyans, but for Libyans. Um, so this is a, a map of the locations where we collected uh, data. Um, as you can see, Aleppo, Idlib, Damascus in uh, Syria, and, uh, and Tripoli, Beirut, and Stora in, in Lebanon. But I, for this paper, I only focus on the on the data from Beirut and Stora. Um, and in uh, Libya, uh, we collected interviews in Benghazi, Tripoli, um, Sfax, and uh, Tunis. Um, what we tried to do with our sampling design um, was to, um, to reflect diversity with regards to different experiences of displacement, return and immobility, um, the current city of residence, um, the time of displacement, uh, gender and educational background. Um, and these interviews were mostly live uh, histories. Um, with follow up questions inquiring into how war was experienced. Uh, flights, uh, their flight trajectories and future plans, um, as well as the perceptions of uh, life in the current place of uh, residence. Um, and the analysis focused on, on the one hand, mapping displacement trajectories, uh, identifying dominant motives for displacement and uh, mobility and immobility in narratives, and associating motives with specific phases of displacement trajectories. Um, so here you can see an overview um, of um, the interview sample. Um, what I think is uh, crucial about this table is that almost all uh, respondents fell into different categories. So um, almost all respondents uh, experienced internal and external, not external, but displacement and Im immobility and were on the one hand either at times displaced, but also hosted displaced uh, family members. Um, so when we look first uh, now at subjective experiences of violence, um, it became clear from the, from, from the narratives that uh, different subjective experiences of violence committed by regime forces, oppositional groups and or militia structured um, displacement trajectories. Um, and respondents made a distinction between, on the one hand, personal threats, generalized forms of violence, and a feeling of increasing hopelessness related to the future absence of violence without an immediate threat to life. Um, uh, when it comes to personal threats, these, were, uh, these uh, relate to personal pers persecution based on the respondent's political opinion or perceived political positioning in the conflict uh, based on group identity, um, threats and obligations to have to participate in armed fight, um, but also exposure to violence through imprisonment, potential imprisonment and torture or actual exposure. Um, 
Generalized violence relates to bombings, approaching battle uh, lines, and, uh, and was in, in general the most prevalent form of uh, violence that people talked about. Um, and a feeling of increasing hopelessness um, uh, was also a, a, a narrative that was um, present in, in, in interviews, but um, uh, a bit less. Um, so but different subjective experiences of violence were a core, core motive for respondents' displacement, especially at the beginning of trajectories, but also over time, um, respondents had multiple experiences with violence. Um, and experiences of violence triggered different exit movements across internal and external borders. On the one hand, within conflict lines, so internally, um, these were mostly short distances and people stayed with family. This was uh, most pre um, prevalent uh, across conflict lines, also internally. This was less prevalent and often happened as, at a second step. Um, and across internal borders, um, but also mostly over short distances um, and often first staying with extended family. Um, so these different ex subjective experiences of violence were also related to different uh, temporalities, how fast decisions were taken, but also how long displacement was imagined to be. Um, so personal threats, which uh, uh, respondents often refer to as the threat, um, uh, translated often into a fast decision to leave and was originally imagined to be temporary. Um, a lot of respondents reacted to internal displacement, some external displacement with very few external return movements. Um, when it comes to generalized violence, um, which respondents often to as the crisis came, um, respondents uh, explained that they left after a tipping point of fear was reached, um, was similarly uh, originally imagined as temporary, and uh, uh, respondents reacted with a lot of inline displacement, often short term, but also external displacement with more external return. Um, and increasing hopelessness related to the future absence of violence um, was often related to a slower decision after staying for a long time and was often, more often imagined as permanent um, and was related to more external displacement. Um, apart from these nar um, narratives that centered around vi different types of violence, uh, accounts about the good life before the war were extremely um, essential in respondents' narratives. Um, um, either aspirations before the war, but also interrupted and changing life goals. Um, people talked about a tipping point when either when life became miserable or life got stuck. Um, people talked about, for example, in the following words um, about uh, life aspirations. Approximately my future, not only my future, but also the future of my siblings, half of them disappeared. So if I could continued life there, it would be a waste of my life. I can't build myself there or develop my abilities in the current status of Libya. Then the war started and my project was cancelled, as well as my dreams and plans. So life collapsed and I didn't know what to do next. My problem is that I lost my life. I lost everything. The most important thing is that I'm working. I go for walks. I don't want more to live as I want. Um, so this, the experiences of violence uh, that I talked about basically intersected with aspirations to realize broader life goals, mostly related to love, career and education, but also um, social and political change. Um, when it comes to aspirations about around love and family, these uh, were aspirations to either stay together um, as a family or with a partner. Uh, it was the most important category, it was also sometimes talked about as an aspiration, but also an obligation, um, and was it as a driver to stay, leave and return. Um, but now I'm responsible for a family. These people are my parents as they brought me to where I am now. It does not make sense for my family to be in need and I'm with them. As I could achieve my dream, my brothers have the right to achieve their dreams with my help. 
Um, secondly, um, extremely um, prevalent were also aspirations centered around work, education and career. Um, and these were often described as um, situated between survival and aspirations. Um, they were mostly a driver to leave, but also to stay and return. Um, for example, this is a respondent uh, in, in Beirut who says, a Syrian in Lebanon cannot do what he wants. He cannot study as he wants. There is no one working with their diplomas generally. My husband worked for a while in a restaurant. He told me the group he was working with, there are engineers, lawyers, journalists, doctors, no one is working with their diplomas and people cannot endure this a lot, maybe three, four years, but afterwards they want to find a solution. Um, and thirdly, um, aspirations related to social and political change. Um, these were respondents who wanted to promote democratic change, assist civilians, but also mobilize militantly for, for different uh, groups. Um, and these aspirations show the trend for staying close, but also inline um, return. And the respondents often took very high risks to, to do so. Um, a respondent, for example, described this in the following words. I don't want to get out of it at all, because it is our duty not to leave our house and land and go and run away. I went back to defend my land and my country and my village and the people here. It was one of the things that affected me the most. Um, so what comes, uh, what becomes clear from this analysis is that on the one hand, life aspirations um, are situated on a continuum between aspiration and obligations. Um, they are on the move and changing and they are gendered and stratified. I don't have time here to, to, to go into more detail here, but I'm very happy to share the paper if you're, if you're more interested in this aspect. Um, and life aspirations often play a more important, important role once people move out of a, situate, a situation of immediate danger um, and play a role across different phases of displacement trajectories, depending on respondents imaginations where they can be realized um, and can be a driver for staying internally moving leaving and returning um, and life aspirations also outweigh perceptions of violence in some cases motivating people to stay and even return uh, to violent contexts um, i don't know if i have time to go into yeah to two to examples. Um, so I wanted to basically um, show two examples um, from Syria, um, from the respondents who have remained in Syria um, since, uh, yes, for, for a long time. Um, the first uh, respondent, Ahlam from Al Hajar al Aswad. Uh, is, a, is, a, is a woman who was 27 years old when we interviewed her. Um, she was born in, in Al Hajar al Aswad, which is a city located um, four kilometers south of uh, Damascus. Uh, she had a university degree and uh, was single um, and lived in Damascus at the time of the interview. Um, her family had roots in Idlib in uh, northwest Syria, which has been uh, a stronghold of the opposition since the beginning of the, um, of the conflict. Um, but at the same time, her father was a military officer in the Syrian army. So this family background made her basically um, suspicious, made her family suspicious both to state authorities and rebel groups uh, alike. So in 2012, uh, Al Hajar Al Aswad's control was contested between the Syrian regime and the Free Syrian Army, um, with shelling by government forces and the clashes happening between rebels and uh, the army, um, which then also spread to the to the neighboring Yamuk uh, uh, Palestinian camp. In 2014, the area became a hotspot uh, for ISIS uh, before being uh, recaptured by regime forces. Uh, in 2018. So Ahlam's trajectory is uh, a good example for a trajectory that is driven by uh, experiences of generalized forms of violence, personal threats, but also for me, family and uh, career aspirations. Um, so Ahlam studied uh, pharmacy when the uprising and the conflict broke out in 2011 
and did not take part in any political activities back then. Um, but when uh, the city got bombed in 2012, the family moved in with relatives in, in, the, in Yamuk, in the neighboring uh, uh, neighborhood. Um, and when Yamuk was uh, shelled uh, one year later and the Free Syrian Army took control, um, the family decided to move uh, to Jaramana, a neighborhood in, in Damascus that was uh, considered more neutral and had affordable rents at the time. Um, and since then, Ahlam continued to live in Jaramana until the day of, of our interview. And uh, after Ahlam's family, father died in 2013, um, um, of a kidney failure, she took over the financial responsibility for the family and started to work uh, in a factory, a factory where she became head of department. Um, and Ahlam was never able to return to Al Hajar al Aswad um, the because the neighborhood became part of a governmental reconstruction plan uh, and restricted the access uh, to previous owners uh, without uh, compensation. Um, and it was a combination of factors that made Ahlam stay in Syria. On the one hand, a strong commitment to her family, uh, not wanting to leave her mother behind, but also her aspiration to finish her studies and open her own pharmacy, but also the risks and costs involved when leaving Syria as a single woman. Um, she also rejected the idea of, of getting married to be able to, to leave. Um, the second example uh, I wanted to highlight here um, is uh, Karim from Jabal al -Asawiya. By the way, these are all these are not real names, right? Uh, to to just to to, <laughs> to highlight that. Um, so Karim um, was a 60, uh, 36 year old man who uh, was born in in Idlib uh, governorate. Uh, he was also university educated. Um, and was married and had uh, two kids at the, um, uh, and was living in still in Jabal Asawia in uh, Syria's northwest uh, when we interviewed him. And Karim worked in a ministry in 2011 um, and his family was known to su support the opposition at, at, at the beginning of the uprising. So Karim's trajectory on the other hand uh, highlights the importance of personali personalized threats for leaving um, but also political aspirations for staying and returning. Um, so Karim experienced external displacement, external return, multiple internal displacement, uh, internal return, but also long phases of staying. Um, so Karim um, had strong political aspirations, but also educational aspirations linked to his desire to change society and politics. Um, so he left in 2012 uh, to Turkey to join other activists and to work with international NGOs providing aid to Syrian civilians while his wife and children, uh, children uh, stayed behind. Um, and he returned one year later um, because he wanted to support the civilian population in this region, safeguard his property and ultimately considered staying as an act of resistance. Um, Yes, so I think I have uh, somehow reached the end of my 40 minutes, so um, I'm going to uh, conclude. Um, what um, I want, I think what is crucial to, to highlight again from this empirical paper um, is that subjective experiences and temporal uh, temporalities are both crucial to understand immobilities and mobilities in situations of protected displacement. Um, through the narratives, you um, get really a feeling of how time accelerates and time gets stuck um, in, in contexts where people have to take uh, these very difficult decisions. Um, then subjective experiences of violence were a key driver for often rapid exit move, um, movements, mostly inside conflict countries, but also across international borders, especially at the beginning of displacement uh, trajectories and the loss of hope regarding the future absence of violence was related to more permanent and long distance exit movements. Um, and life aspirations related to love, career and politics often played a more important role over time and in later stages of displacement trajectories and influenced 
mobility and immobility patterns in three different directions, uh, stay, move, but also return. And political aspirations were also very crucial at beginnings of displacement trajectories with a tendency to remain and stay close. Um, I think what this uh, case study also shows is that the distinction between different mobility and immobility categories are blurred. Um, so respondents almost all fell in different categories and uh, talked about their experiences as situated uh, on a continuum between forced and voluntary. Um, and similarly, aspirations were in some cases located on a continuum between aspiration and obligation. And with this, I want to close. Thank you everyone for listening and I'm very happy to, to get questions and, uh, and react. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. I'll make sure to stop the recording now.